My name is Andrew uh, Getman. I'm one of the booksellers here at Politics and Prose. I'm really happy to welcome Christopher Jansma for Unchangeable Spots of Leopards. Um, when, I, when I got a, a, a copy of the book early on, I, I immediately fell in love with his writing style and the characters. Um, it, because it's, 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 it's like a journey. You're, t you're taking this, this trip along with the, the narrator, and you're not really sure where it's going to go, but the, because of the writing, you're completely absorbed. So Christopher's um, a, a teacher of writing, and he's, he publishes a blog, Literary Artifacts, which I encourage you to check out. Um, but I'm going to let you, him tell you more about the unchangeable spots of leopards. I'm really happy to welcome him to politics and prose. Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming out again on uh, such a beautiful day. Um, but uh, um, thank you for that wonderful introduction. And uh, thanks to everyone here at Politics and Prose for, uh, for having me. This is uh, a huge honor to read here. Um, and thank you for coming out and patronizing one of the area's best independent bookstores. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think everything uh, Andrew said was uh, was true. Um, uh, the the story uh, is about a writer um, who is very different from myself. Uh, very little of what actually happens in the book is uh, based in in real reality, but that's kind of the fun of it. Uh, I think that's sort of what fiction's all about. Um, and uh, I, I can go into more detail about this later. If anybody has questions, we'll do a little Q and A afterwards. But. Uh, I'm going to read to you today from chapter three in the book, which is called The Unchangeable Spots of Leopards. Um, it was the first chapter that I wrote um, in, the, uh, in the book. Uh, I was working on uh, a project, uh, this was in early 2009, I was working on a project where I was trying to complete writing 40 stories over the course of a year, uh, which I got into partly because I'd been trying to write novels over and over again, and uh, every time I tried, I would end up utterly failing and end in total disaster. So. Uh, so I thought maybe short stories would be a good thing to get back to, return to the fundamentals, uh, and then I wrote this story about 13 weeks into the process and I suddenly realized that uh, I had accidentally started writing a novel again. Um, and these characters just totally absorbed me and I wanted to write all, nothing but about them for, for weeks more. So. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to read to you guys uh, from the chapter three, The Unchangeable Spots of Leopards. Uh, and uh, I'm going to read the, uh, s uh, it's almost totally the same, uh, I'm going to read the like PG-13 rated version of the chapter. Um, okay. Maybe I won't then. Bye, Sophie. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> um, so here we go. Um, and uh, yeah, okay. This morning, his name is Simon. He's sitting on our couch besides the picture windows through which comes a golden view of Soho and Tribeca. Simon's lower half is wrapped in one of my towels and he is sucking the milk out of a bowl of my frosted wheats and watching men swimming on my television. They all have the same look each time, the Simons, give or take. The ribbed chests, the high cheekbones, the tidy haircuts. This one has kind of a busted nose, not one of Julian's finest. Better than last Thursday's Philip, or had he also been a Simon? It's always something like Simon, Trevor maybe, or Spencer, or Colin. One time we had a Jeff with a G. Name Simon, says Simon. Have you seen this guy? Phenomenal. He gestures to ESPN with my spoon, sending a fine spray of milk off across our suede upholstered cocktail ottoman. Technically, it is Julian's suede upholstered cocktail ottoman, but without me around to sponge up the residue, left behind by the many Simons, the ottoman would have gone out with last year's trash in which case he'd have replaced it with a George Bullock octagonal table with inlaid lotus leaves or something equally absurd. What guy, I ask. Julian likes me to be polite to his overnight guests, although he certainly never is. Mitchell King, Simon shouts through a, a mouth of frosted wheat. Phenomenal! As he shouts, little flecks of cereal land on Julian's checkerboard, which he keeps framed on the wall. I brush them off quickly. New York Magazine has Mitchell King on its cover this month, all seven feet of him, crossing an Olympic-sized pool in a single stroke. Simon watches as the all-American phenomenon does an underwater turnaround in digitized slow motion. His body curls up like a beige fish and shoots away again. Suddenly, there's the sound of water from the bathroom. Julian is awake. Simon grins and sets the bowl down on the table, leaving a ring of milk. When he stands up to greet his one-time lover, I can only grin as I lift the bowl and wipe the milk with the edge of my sleeve. Bonjour à toi, et aussi un matin doré, 
Sorry for my French there. Uh, <laughs> Julian strides into the room, arms extended to the sunny Sunday skyline. He wears a stolen hotel bathrobe, and his curly hair is matted from sleep. Soon he will carefully tussle it, tussle it with a Venetian cream and claim it looks somehow different. Uh, when he spots Simon, however, Julian's nicotine-starred lungs deflate. Jazz brunch, I remind him cheerily as I make myself scarce. Julian will now eject Simon from the apartment with the cold proficiency of an East Berlin customs agent. <laughs> Visa expired, this Simon won't be back in our country again. Jazz brunch has been a weekly ritual since Julian and I moved to this great city in the East three years ago. Fresh out of college, we were two writers ready for the world to anoint us as its newest young geniuses. Our heads were filled with Fitzgeraldian dreams of rooms in the Biltmore Hotel and of writing our great American novels at the cafes along 6th, 6th Avenue and then on to have stakes at Delmonico's with girls named Honora and Marjorie. In my defense, I'd only ever read about New York. Julian had actually been here before. Still, he acted as if the modern city with her graffitied subways and omnipresent bodegas was just some sort of temporary wrinkle in the fabric of civilization. Julian's parents were currently off in Switzerland somewhere, running McGann International Trading, but part of their diversified portfolio included various rental properties around the island, one of which Julian and I had taken up residence in just off of Washington Square Park. Even this morning, as we strolled towards the arch in two-toned shoes and brisk biscuit tweed, Julian seemed startled to find the square crawling with bearded NYU students propelling themselves about on skateboards and not horse-drawn carriages or a top, uh, not a horse-drawn carriage or a top hat in sight, as Henry James had promised. As she does every Sunday, Evelyn meets us on the corner. This morning, she clutches a script in her left hand, which bears the familiar cragged face of Samuel Beckett. Her right hand holds a lit cigarette and a clump of wildflowers, roots attached. Evelyn Lynn Madison Dumont. Even four Anglo-Saxon names cannot contain her. She should be a the third or a countess to something or other. My heart has been lost in the frozen tundras of hers ever since Julian first introduced us in our college days seven years ago. Now the accidental thought of her sends sparks through me like I am one of Henry Adams's dynamos. Everything I write is for her. None of it is ever good enough. If it isn't Jeeves and Wooster, you two are later every week. She grabs my wrist and checks the time on my gold watch. Then, pretending to scowl, she plants a kiss on each of our cheeks. Her blonde hair smells of buttercream and her white skin of lemonade. Her lips brush against my cheek and they feel like the chitinous wings of a dragonfly. We are unavoidably detained, Julian says. By a Simon, I add, with a roll of my eyes. Julian is too busy stealing her cigarette to hear me. He inhales desperately, though he has only just finished one on our way over. Somewhere, back inside the park, comes the loud clatter of a skateboarder who has just screwed up a trick. Julian mumbles some vague threats about moving to Prague. In truth, he's been threatening to leave the city for all sorts of reasons ever since we arrived, but we know he won't, not without us. He jabs the lit end towards the flowers. Where are those from? I mugged this little orphan boy for them, she says, inserting two bluebells in my lapel and a prairie aster in Julian's. She t tucks a mid-sized daisy into her hair and drops the remainder on the sidewalk without a second's thought. Shall we? she asks, tucking the becket away into some heretofore, heretofore, unforeseen, heretofore unseen purse. She extends an unblemished forearm, and I hook my elbow around it. I can't go on, I say, with the dramatic air of quoting things. I'll go on. Jazz brunch at the Washington, once held weekly in a lush ballroom to hundreds of Manhattan's elite, has in recent decades been moved into a small cove on the basement level and done up like a high-class speakeasy. Maybe in Fitzgerald's time, jazz music was a call to revolution, chaotic, arousing, and ever-changeable. It disturbed the natural order. It tore up the old millennium with its absurd wars and its drudgerous puritanism. It declared reckless independence once and for all. But in our era of anthemic dance beats, power chords, and casually rhymed profanities, jazz music has become quaint and old-fashioned, appreciated only by those who are born too late, namely the three of us. A heavyset black woman croons Etta into a microphone. A guitar player with a beer gut sweats and strums. A little Latino gentleman squeaks along on the trumpet. The tiny crowd, aside from us, all appear to be over 50. Their accents are thick with Long Island and New Jersey. Once upon a time, I'd have been counted as one of their numbers, but now they look admiringly at me in the close company of Julian and Evelyn. Four, please, Evelyn instructs the hostess, who is also the only waitress for the room, a brunette ball of curls with a small golden stud in her left nostril. Can't you count, Julian says? We're three. Every week, we're three. I've asked someone to come and meet us. As the waitress leads us to our table, Julian, ever change averse, begins to complain. 
Haven't we spoken about inviting strangers to brunch? Haven't we agreed that foreigners must be approved by a majority not more than two days prior to brunch so as to allow for proper background checks? <laughs> by background checks, he means asking me to perform a Yahoo search. Julian still types everything on his Remington, not even an electric. Evelyn presses a slim, sturdy finger into my breastbone. Well, every time I invite someone, you make him vote against it. She slides onto the deep purple crushed velvet banquette. High above her is a small opening on the sidewalk level where light comes down over us in between the steady passing of disembodied shoes. I defend myself. You don't have to live with him when he doesn't get his way. And I said that your friend Charity could come, and Rosalind, and Gwyneth. I sit across from her and Julia next to me as usual. Yes, and funny how afterward you wind up taking them to the zoo or something and I never hear from them again, she says, with an indecipherable smile. I feed them to the leopards, I say, flashing an arched eyebrow. She sighs and studies the menu, though we all know it by heart. There's very little about Jazz Brunch that we don't know by heart. By heart, she knows that I will try to make her jealous by going off with her friends. By heart, I know that she brings only the ones she's bored of, half hoping I'll fall for one of them, do myself some good, and put her behind me. By heart, she knows that she'll call me within an hour of departing brunch and sulk for days if I don't pick up. Charity, Rosalind, and Gwyneth each hardly made it to the monkey house before figuring out that my heart was still nestled far away by her heart. Gwyneth had left me by the exotic birds. Rosalind hadn't minded. She told me she thought we were, like, so completely tragic for each other. Or had that been charity, actually? It's always something like charity. Coffee, immediately, Julian instructs our waitress. waitress. Frightened, she does a sort of unconscious curtsy and is back with coffee in moments. Julian has his idiosyncrasies to be sure, but he knows how to get good service. The singer wraps up, tell mama, and we all pause to give brief applause. I feel Evelyn's foot touching mine beneath the table and I try to catch her eye, but it is always off somewhere else by the door. Thank you, thank you. My name is Joe, just Joe, and I'm here with the talented. But as she moves to introduce her two band members, one of the older women in the room lets loose a guttural noise and a commotion bruise. We turn to see what is going on and spot the swimmer, Mitchell King, all phenomenal seven feet of him, descending the steps into the room. He passes several blushing senior citizens, then greets Evelyn with an eager kiss. He sits down across from an utterly bewildered Julian, rendered silent for perhaps the first time since we've moved to New York. Mitchell King, says Mitchell King, mighty pleased to meet you both. His buttery southern voice sounds just as it does on ESPN. He extends a hand larger than a dinner plate, and I have no choice but to shake it. I think I can feel my metacarpal shattering. <laughs> Julian jumps to summon our waitress again, mostly to avoid shaking hands with this Goliath, and a pitcher of mimosas as soon as humanly possible. The room begins to settle like the surface of a lake after a boulder has unexpectedly fallen into it. The jazz singer, Just Joe, takes her boys into Something's Got a Hold on, on Me, and we are left to face the gigantic swimmer. Fortunately, Julian is highly trained in the art of dismissive small talk. So nice of you to join us, Mitchell. We were watching you on television just a half hour ago. How, d how did you get here from the pool so quickly? Actually, that was taped last night, Mitchell explains rather earnestly, at the World Aquatics Championships in Japan. I just flew back into town this morning. With all those time zones, I get confused myself sometimes. We crossed the international date line, so yesterday, for me, it was already today. How insane is that? Julian stares, open mouthed just a moment longer than he should. How did you and Evelyn meet, I ask, figuring that I may as well take my turn. I went to see her play. My agent likes to take me out when I'm in town. An agent, Julian mumbles venomously, but only I can hear him. Mitchell went out during intermission and bought me a bouquet of daisies and then met me by the stage door with them, Evelyn says, running her hands up and down his hairless forearm so slowly that each of my own arm hairs feels a pang of jealousy. Evelyn was playing Arena in the hit off-Broadway revival of Three Sisters. I had attended 15 of, of the performances, each time leaving a crimson florilegium of roses in her dressing room afterward. Evelyn always says that when she thinks about me sitting there in the front row, she becomes afraid of losing her character. She says it would simply be the end of her. So I never tell her which shows I'm coming to, and I sit back beneath the dark underhang of the mezzanine with a set of Julian's opera glasses and my heirloom roses, and I watch and I wait. She'd been impressed by daisies? Seriously? I fidget with the bluebells she lodged in my lapel. The daisy in her own hair still hangs there perfectly. Even the laws of gravity must obey Evelyn. Evelyn has no doubt given Mitchell the impression that Julian and I must be impressed if their relations are to go any further, which is probably why he goes on ad nauseum about his book. It is to be about how athletics showcase the triumph of the human spirit and the meaning of human perseverance and sportsmanship and teamwork, and just as Julian and I are getting ready to hang ourselves by our skinny neckties, 
the waitress finally scurries back with a bucket of champagne on ice and a pitcher of blood orange juice. Julian is set to launch into his complex brunch order, which always involves wheat toast without crusts and salmon eggs benedict but without the benedict. Only Mitchell holds out a gargantuan hand before Julian can begin. Ladies first, he says, gesturing to Evelyn. Julian looks as if he might chew Mitchell's chiseled face off. This is not the usual order of things. There is a pause. He downs his mimosa in a single gulp and sulks. Evelyn orders the Caesar salad with smoked trout, fish cold, please, and then Julian jumps right back in with his elaborate demands. Feeling shaky, I opt for the steak and eggs, but bloody, thinking that I might, update my, uh, might up my iron intake. Mitchell orders a granola and yogurt to start, and then pecan pancakes with a ham omelet, making sure this comes with greens and home fries, and then sides of chicken apple sausage and cheddar biscuits. I've got this Parkinson's charity meet tomorrow. Carbs and protein, carbs and protein, the Mitchell King diet, that's going to be my next book. <laughs> he winks like he's letting us in on some sort of insider trading deal. Sensing that Julian is gearing up for some epic rant, Evelyn quickly turns to me. So Mitchell is from the Raleigh area. Go Green Jackets, I say, weakly. As much as it pains me to engage Evelyn's new boyfriend in conversation, it is nothing compared with the pain I'd feel chatting about my blue-collar childhood in front of Julian, who smirks continually. No, Mitchell cries. Go Crusaders. Don't tell me you are a cracker. Just Joe is belting out a nice rendition of Little Boy Blue, which allows me to mumble surreptitiously to Julian while Mitchell regales Evelyn with his southern high school football lore. He's about as cultured as a mole creature. He'll probably be on about NASCAR next. Evelyn's smarter than this. It just doesn't make any sense. Julian sighs knowingly. Have you seen the size of his hands? He and Evelyn have always had disturbingly similar taste in men. We clap politely and drink. Mitchell's granola and yogurt arrive, the mixing of which occupies him long enough for Evelyn to pay attention to us again. You are two are the worst kinds of snobs, she whispers, under cover of the trumpet, singing a double high C. Don't think that I can't read your awful little lips. At the same time, I can tell she's not surprised, not even really upset. She knew that it would remind us that she has a full life outside of our vicious little circle. At the same time, she also knew that if she brought this Aquaman to jazz brunch, we'd put him through the ringer. Evelyn tells me you guys are writers, says Mitchell cheerfully. What all do you write? Julian jumps on the chance to tinker with Mitchell's head. I'm working on a novel right now. It's essentially an homage to the deconstructed romans à clé of the late 1700s. Intertextually, I think it will be a smashing success so long as the readers can be trusted to accept the basic premise that the entire thing takes place in a remote outpost in the Andromeda galaxy 30,000 years ago. <laughs> Mitchell cannot think of a single thing to say to this. Of course, Julian is not writing about the Andromeda Galaxy, although he won't say what his novel is actually about, not even to me. Julian has had a story in the Paris Review, Evelyn explains to Mitchell patiently. I have to say I don't really like Paris. I spent a week there once for an invitational, he says, as if anyone cared. Sure, it's nicer than New York, no offense, but it's no Savannah. He looks at me as though he expects me to agree, which I certainly will not. Before Julian can inform him that since 1973, the Paris Review has been published right here in Yes Offense, New York City, I intercede. Mitch, how come we didn't see you in Sydney last summer? Mitchell's mouth stops chewing, and I half wonder if one of his ham-sized hands is about to grab me around the neck, but he forces a thin smile. If he hadn't seen it before, he does now. He is at brunch with a pair of wild animals, and we are out for blood. I know the story already. Everybody does. Two weeks before the Olympics, Mitchell King was caught in a hotel room with half an ounce of blow. By the time the charges had been dropped, he'd been left behind in the Northern Hemisphere. I've made a couple of mistakes, he says tersely, spent some time getting to know myself a little better, consulted with my priest. Now, tell us a little bit about that, Julian urges. What do they tell you to do? Kneel down and say Hail Marys? Self-flagellation with rosary beads? Details, please, I'm doing research for my book. What would Catholics be doing in the Andromeda galaxy 28,000 years before the births of birth of Christ, I wonder loudly. But Julian kicks me under the table with a bruising saddle shoe. Wormhole, he says snappily. I don't know if he's referring to his book or to me. We are drinking the champagne straight up now. The rest of Mitchell's food arrives, our waitress wilting under the weight of it. After the food has been laid out, she says, you're Mitchell King, dra dabbing a sweat from the nape of her neck. Her tiny golden nose stud catches the light. Please, Julian sighs, we're trying to enjoy our meal. No, Mitchell says firmly, giving Julian a stern look. I'm happy to meet a fan. Evelyn is looking on with cool detachment as the brunette twirls a finger in a curl by her left ear while Mitchell signs her order pad. Amy, he asks, with an A? As I ponder any other ways one might spell the name Amy, I take a bite of my bloody steak and eye Amy's twirling finger. Quite fetching, I mumble to Julian, loud enough for Evelyn to hear. Little flickers of lightning flash behind the grays of her eyes. 
So what's with the Beckett? I ask lightly. My positive charge catches her burgeoning negative one, and there's a spark of electricity that recalls many mistakes of nighttime's past which we never speak of during the day. I have an audition tomorrow for a new adaptation of The Unnameable. Just Joe erupts into a sweet and sultry, I found a love, and for a moment, Mitchell and Julian temporary exiled from our periphery, I feel as if Evelyn and I were sitting alone. She gushes something about the theater of the absurd, and I'm arguing against this idea of the destitution of modern man as if we were ever better than this, even as she's trying to agree with me, because it is absolutely just so brave, ultimately, and all the while just devastatingly tragic, and, and then there's this prolonged instant in which I know that she is mine, that her mind loves my mind, and that all my masks and all her costumes are off, and the great green curtains are drawn back, and it's the real Evelyn in me, just as plain as the noon sun coming in above us. So, Mitchell interrupts, staring at me as if he cannot even remember my name. Did you and Julian ever write anything together? I laugh, but not half as loudly as Julian does. Oh, yes, he says drolly, spinning the little purple prairie aster around in his buttonhole like a clown. We've got a four-picture deal with Paramount. I do all the action sequences, and he handles the jokes. Mitchell lights up. A movie? Badass. I'm a bit of a film buff myself. Have you guys seen the new Jurassic Park film? This third one was absolutely the best. Honey, Evelyn condescends. They're joking. Mitchell's beginning to look upset, and I feel a twinge of benevolence. Julian's very private, I explain. We don't really work well together. Julian's creative process involves drinking three bottles of wine over the course of an afternoon, stalking about the apartment in his old robe from a hotel in Zurich, and smoking while leaning precariously out of our windows until inspiration or the urge to nap strikes. <laughs> I do all my own writing at the New York Public Library. What do you actually write, then? Mitchell asks me, pointing, pointing, pointedly waving a speared chicken apple sausage in my direction. Short fiction now, I explain, though I was working on this novel last year about an apprentice to a gilder in New York in the 1860s who steals... Wait, was? What happened? Mitchell asks. Julian flashes an angry look at Evelyn, who tries to pat her bow on the hand to indicate it's time to shut up, but he goes right on ahead. Don't tell me you gave up. Let me tell you something. Winners never quit. That is the first piece of advice I talk about in my book. It's not that I gave up exactly, I say coolly. I lost it. You lost it? Yes. What, like under a couch cushion or something? Mitchell laughs, miming a look under his own gargantuan seat. Evelyn kicks him now and looks apologetically at me, but I ignore her. Mitchell, no idea what he's done wrong, struggles to think of something else to ask. So I'm prim working primarily on short fiction again, I said flatly, trying to get back to basics. Mitchell smiles as if he understands. Cool, so are you in the um, Paris Magazine then too? Julian laughs, a co hard, cold laugh, and it is just enough to, to make me admit to something I hadn't intended to. Actually, I have something coming out next month in the Vicksburg Review. Julian stops chewing. Evelyn, God, my heart might stop, is beaming. Vicksburg? Julian asks, as if unfamiliar with the concept. They're preeminent. You should have told us earlier, Evelyn says. What's it about? Julian's face is darkened, approaching blackened. Yes, which is it? Evelyn gives him a look that could cut diamonds, and even Julian knows to change tacks. He leans on, uh, sorry, skipping down here a little bit. I, I think about lying, but saying, maybe saying it's something older, but there's no way they won't read it once it's out. It's not like Julian to forget these things. It's based, you know, quite loosely, with all the names changed and everything, on this road trip that Julian and I took to the lake upstate last winter. You remember when you got really sick? Julian drops his fork on the plate. He actually drops it. The noise reverberates as the guitar player comes off the end of a long solo. You can't, he says slowly. You absolutely cannot. He yells this final word so loudly that just Joe skips a beat and all I could do is cry. And some of the old Long Island ladies turn and stare at him with death's own eyes. Mitchell, all alpha male, slides a meaty paw in between us. Whoa, fellas, he says. But Julian slaps his, slaps his hand away. Well... Not so much away, but he does slap it. <laughs> Mitchell, Evelyn snaps. Don't get in the middle of this. It has nothing to do with you. He shrinks back, losing two feet in height to the tone of her voice. Didn't we agree? Didn't we agree that we ourselves, that is, that one another, that it's off limits, that it is absolutely off fucking limits? Sorry, skipped a page there. Um, he's so upset that he's grabbing for his pack of cigarettes, and when he realizes he's still inside, he gets even more furious and downs another flute of champagne. I say nothing, not that he has never kept a single promise to me in his entire life, not that I keep trying not to write about him, and not that I always wind up doing it anyway. 
Finally, I say weakly, I changed your name and all that. I gave it a kind of Russian theme after seeing Ev in Three Sisters 15 times. It kind of got under my, you're moving out, he declares smugly as he sets the empty flute down. And that's that. I want nothing to do with you, no more. He looks down at his plate and flicks a great blob of his eggs at me. The golden yolk runs down my shirt and leaves a forbidding stain. You're nothing but a petty thief, he shouts. Liar! Thief! The old ladies are getting very upset now. Young man, would you? Oh, go back to hell, he cries, or Staten Island, or wherever it is you're from. Just Joe is stopped mid-song. Amy, the waitress, is coming over, sliding between tables faster than Mitchell could, keep, could leap off the starting block. Please, she squeaks, please keep your voices down. But Julian is past the point of no return. He overturns his plate. He launches himself out of the chair, shouts that he will see the manager about this, and propels himself past the other patrons and out of the room. Dude, Mitchell says, scooting back from the table. A camera flashes somewhere. This is, uh, I'm sorry, those, those ladies are taking photos. I can't, I mean, my agent says I can't afford to be in Us Weekly again. Go, go, Evelyn says, waving her hand in the air dismissively. He promises to call, and she gives him a look that says he'd be a fool to bother. He seems confused, not entirely sure where he's gone wrong. And then, because there's still a camera flashing, he strides off, hands hiding his face as though he were some sort of criminal. Terribly sorry, everyone, I say to the room, just a small misunderstanding. You know you've really done it this time, Evelyn says softly as Just Joe begins her song over again. He'll get over it, I say. Evelyn looks skeptical. True, I've never gotten a story about him published before, but I have been down this road with Julian many times. The truth is that without me, he has no one, just Evelyn, who gets tired of him without me around, and a long string of wine bottles and a longer string of Simons, each emptier than the last. Without me around, he'll lose what little sanity he has left. I go on. He'll break into my room now, read it, spend half an hour figuring out how to delete the file, but that's fine, the Vicksburg people already have it. How many times have I told you to make backups? Don't you ever learn? This I ignore, because what is there to say? No, I don't. None of us ever learns. He'll drink half our Grey Goose, pass out on the bathroom floor, I'll bring home some Campari tonight, we'll do our whole Hemingway and Fitzgerald routine. Secretly, he's flattered already. He might even tell me he liked the story. You better hope you're right. Where else would you go? I shrug. Will we be seeing Mitchell King again? No, I don't think we will. It is always this way with her. She brings them here to us once they begin to bore her, and we devour them. It is all routine. And now that it's actually just us, just Evelyn and I, strangely, I feel that there is nothing left to say, or really that we've said all there is to say too many times before. What is the point of running through these lines one more time? She says, you should start seeing somebody else. And I say, is this about money? She, don't be absurd. And I, you're the one who's being absurd. We can't keep going on like this. Then go. We do not move. She says, you know you only think you want me. And I say, you know you only think you don't. She sighs. You're such a liar. Quit acting, I grin. Long silence. Thinking that maybe we can get philosophical about Beckett again, I ask, what time's your audition tomorrow? I'm sure it'll go well. Why don't I come along and take you out afterwards? We'll celebrate. She sits back. No, I have to stay focused. And that is that. Alone, together, we are worse than worthless. Amy comes by with our bill, still terrified, I think, that Julian is going to sick the managers on her, though she's done nothing wrong. The little faux leather booklet lies between Evelyn and me for a long, cold moment. Ordinarily, Julian pays. I reach for my wallet, which we both know is empty. She reaches for her purse. My treat, she says, to celebrate for the story. She drops two hundreds on the table as if it were nothing. For her, it is. It is, in fact, more than I'll be paid for the story. I'll get it next time, I lie. I'll never get it. We both know it. See you next Sunday, she says, and kisses me gently on the forehead. Then she taps my bluebells with her finger, and I'm left to listen to the end of At Last, Alone. I can't go on, I think to myself, scraping Julian's eggs off my shirt. I'll go on. Curly-haired Amy comes back with the change. I siphon off an over-apologetic tip and slide it back to her. Her nose stud glints as her round face breaks into a smile. Thanks so much. She thinks the money is mine, and I don't correct her. In fact, I tuck the ample remainder into my pocket and pour myself the last of the champagne. As I do, I notice Evelyn hovering by the mirror at the exit, fixing her makeup, or pretending to. So, Amy says, beginning to clean up the eggs sans Benedict that Julian has splattered, how do you know Mitchell King? Who, Mitch? I say, fumbling a Savannah accent. I can only fake it now. Oh, why, we went to school together down in North Carolina. Benedictine Academy. Go cadets. Amy giggles and eyes the bluebells. I like your little flowers. Well, thank you kindly, miss. My name's Simon, I lie. 
extending a hand to hers. She grips it, ladylike, and I glance at the mirror before I ask her, Would you like to come with me to the zoo this afternoon? Have you ever seen the leopards? Thanks. Sorry, one sec. Um, I'd love to answer any questions as soon as I have a sip. Um, thank you for listening. Uh, you said something uh, in your introduction about how you came to this story first and then constructed it um, out after that. Yeah. Well, the novel has like a really interesting form to it that it takes on a, its own life. It's really uh, intriguing. So I was wondering, how did you come about constructing that form without, you know, zoning in on that at the beginning to actually like construct it that way? Right. Um, so uh, as I was saying before, I, I, I wrote that one story uh, as part of this story writing project that I was working on. And uh, the next week, I actually wrote another. I was so sort of into those characters, I decided to write a second story about them. Uh, which this won't give too much away, but I ended up writing sort of, I, I needed something else to write about, and I thought, well, I'll write the story that he's describing in that story. Uh, and then I did that, and then the next week I wrote another one that sort of folds into the same thing. Um, and so the form kind of came out of that just sort of each week, uh, so, sort of throughout the rest of that year as I was struggling to come up with new uh, stories to write, occasionally I would come back to these same characters and uh, and then I'd write in sort of a new chapter, uh, something that involved them. And uh, it ended up getting written totally out of order. Um, and then it took about a year after all the stories were finished being written um, to actually go back and sort of rearrange things and to kind of find a, an order that it made sense for all the pieces to come into. Um, especially uh, at the end, because I really wanted it to feel like a novel and not to feel like a collection of linked stories. Um, not that there's anything wrong with collections of linked stories, but I, 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 you know, I figured I was so close to finally writing a novel that I, I might as well do it. So. Um, but that took a, that took quite a while afterwards to kind of you know rearrange the pieces and uh, and write a few new sections that kind of frame the frame the whole thing so that it uh, makes sense. Um, up there, sure. No problem. Sorry. Um, I'm hope I I hope I'm not giving away too much here. But what made you decide to do the second half of the book with all the details kind of? Okay. Flipped a little yeah, bit. Yeah, don't say too much more. Um, <laughs> it uh, it came out of the uh, out of that process of, of writing the uh, of writing the book in sort of different pieces. Um, there was a um, there's a there's sort of a shift halfway through the novel, and I, I probably shouldn't say more than that. But um, where um, where the narrator sort of he goes uh, goes sort of off on an adventure. The second half of the book involves a lot of uh, sort of uh, traveling all around the world. The narrator goes to uh, Ghana, um, Sri Lanka. Uh, Iceland, Luxembourg, all these different places. So, um, yeah, it kind of evolved just out of the stories. There were there were certain pieces that felt in kind of a different voice and a different tone than the other halves. So, um, so the book is split into two halves. The first half is called uh, "What Was Lost," and the other half is called "What Was Found." Um, and uh, and hopefully, as they all kind of come together, it it, it makes sense. So, um, yeah, I hope that answered the question Thank without you. spoiling it. Come ask me afterwards, and I'll I'll tell you more. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yes, hi. Hi. Um, sort of going off what you were just mentioning is that there's a lot of traveling the world in this novel, and I wanted to mm. learn more about, you know, have you been to all those places and the ones that you hadn't been to? How did you research them? And what uh, are there other parts of the book that you had to do research on because you were unfamiliar with it and right. bring that into the book, you know, expanding beyond what your personal experiences are? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, a debut novel and a, and two jobs as an adjunct professor unfortunately doesn't fund a lot of world travel so uh, so yeah so as I was working on the book I had to uh, invent quite a lot I actually I have been to Ghana um, Iceland uh, sorry Ghana and um, Luxembourg um, but and uh, the Grand Canyon as well they go to um, but in all three of those cases I ended up writing um, I ended up writing the chapter long before I ended up going and then sort of only afterwards um, doing a lot of fact checking and stuff like that um, I had written the Ghana chapter, um, knowing my in-laws are both professors and they were um, teaching out there. And so I knew that I was going to be going there several months away uh, for a week. Uh, and uh, so I wrote the whole chapter, doing a lot of research online. And then I ended up um, you know, going out there and then kind of praying that I hadn't totally missed the mark. Um, and, uh, and I was happy to discover that I had gotten mostly right. Um, based on just the research that I did, um, you know, uh, in, in college, a professor that used to tell us, you know, 15 minutes in a library and you can become an expert on anything, or at least enough to 
sound like an expert in a piece of fiction. Um, and I think nowadays with the internet, it's even easier than that. I think it takes you know a couple of minutes. Um, although as I found, you know, a few minutes uh, in, online, and then you still need to then spend like a half an hour uh, minimum at the library actually checking to make sure all the stuff you read online wasn't totally bogus. But um, but uh, yeah, it's it's pretty. You know, it's there's so much out there that you can do now. Um, you know, with Google Maps, I could uh, literally, you know, pull the little guy over and drop him on the map right in front of the, you know, the train station in Colombo, Sri Lanka, uh, and see what it looked like, you know, and, and, and just be able to describe it. And it's incredible you couldn't have done that, you know, five years ago even. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway. Hi. Hi. So, um, how did you settle on the title, and did you have close contenders? <laughs> um, no, the title was actually something that. Uh, came up pretty quickly. I, I don't. Uh, not everybody does it this way, but I, I often feel like I need to have a title before I can even start writing the actual um, piece. And uh, and this was the title for that first story that I wrote, uh, the, which I just read to you guys. Um, and uh, basically, uh, what had happened was I had gone with a friend of mine that weekend. We'd seen uh, the play Waiting for Godot uh, for the first time, which is referenced all throughout that story. And I'd never read it before. I'd never seen it before. I, I sort of figured it was one of those things where I, I, I got the joke. Like, I know, I know the ending. I know, you know, Godot doesn't show up. Sorry, spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so I never really bothered to actually see it or read it. And then uh, we went and saw it. And I was just so moved by actually just watching. I knew, you know, Godot was never going to show up, but that was sort of besides the point. Um, just watching these two friends who were kind of stuck with one another and couldn't seem to, you know, kind of get away from each other, but also couldn't live without each other. Um, and uh, so anyway, that was kind of in my head as I was writing the story. Uh, and I was, and I realized that it was a story about people sort of trying to change, and and their friends are sort of holding them back. Um, so the title comes from the Bible, actually, um, and it's uh, the little. Um, quote here is in the book, um, Jeremiah 13, 23, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Neither can you do good who are accustomed to doing evil. Um, and so that's, uh, I, I think in a, in a way, sort of what the whole book is about is this guy um, sort of struggling to see if he can change his spots. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else I can answer? Is there any other question? Because I'll ask another one. If okay, I sure. Maybe this will either provoke somebody else or um, just give us a good moment to close on. Um, so w w one of the things that I, I think we've you've alluded to throughout is um, is the, the the fact that there are these stories that emerge and mm -hmm. some of them are told by the narrator and some of them may be his life and his experience. Um, and and you also said that there there's what is lost and what is found. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so I think one of the things that's interesting is that because these stories are are written and crafted and take a long time to develop, mm -hmm. when when they are lost, it, it's impossible for the narrator to recreate them. Mm -hmm. And as he's trying to grasp on at what what he's lost with his manuscripts and lost in his life in the mm -hmm. past, he 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 has to recreate things in a different way. Mm -hmm. And um, and that that requires some effort for the reader. But I, I just wondered if you could elaborate on what that was like for you as a writer, and um, what you hope the journey is like for the reader. Sure. Um, yeah. Well, it's sort of. Uh, I hope I can answer that. Um, uh, sort of a funny, scary story, but uh, right after I'd finished writing that chapter that I had uh, just read to you guys, which was, of course, the beginning of the whole thing, uh, I was rushing off to meet a friend. I think we were going to watch an episode of Lost or something like that, and uh, and I was uh, and I, I was really excited, and I knew that it was like a better story than I'd written in all the weeks previous, and I really wanted was excited about it, and so I sort of did a dumb thing where I decided I was going to like you know extra save it, double back up just to make sure, and I sort of accidentally wound up messing it up, and I copied over the finished file with a blank file and I had totally lost it and I was like you know in total panic because I, I knew as soon as I finished it I, that I wasn't going to be able to rewrite the whole thing the same way um, because so much of it I think so much of writing is uh, uh, for me at least is what 
happens sort of while you're sitting there um, and as these thoughts are all getting processed and, uh, and, and it's sort of a process of self-discovery, uh, I think, and uh, as the story goes along, I, I often don't know where a story is going to end or what's going to happen in the middle. I like to kind of, you know, get started with something interesting in the beginning and, and sort of uh, the fun for, of it for me is kind of figuring out the puzzle of it in, along, the, along the way, um, you know, ending up with a, a, starting with a page that was blank and ending up with something that you couldn't have predicted that you'd write. Um, and so then to go back and try to imagine, you know, just actually redoing that whole thing is, uh, is impossible. Um, so it worked out. I, I found some program online that like somehow undeleted it and I got the whole thing back and I was, uh, I was relieved. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, so I don't hope that kind of answers the question. Um, the rest of the story, as you said, it, you know, it deals with writers and, uh, and writing a lot, but uh, it's really, I think, uh, at its heart about much more than that. I was telling you earlier, but um, when I first was trying to get someone to publish the novel, uh, one of the reactions I heard from you know people in the publishing industry was that um, nobody really cares about writers, or at least nobody cares about us as much as we care about ourselves, which is probably true. Um, but uh, um, you know, and so, and what I what I eventually realized was that it's it's really a book about so much more than just writers and writing. It's really a book about um, you know, writers are people who are seeking the truth uh, and people who are um, trying to you know deceive us, uh, and those are very you know sort of universal human uh, experiences. So I think it's uh, you know, uh, even if you aren't particularly interested in writing yourself, it's it's still a, a book that anybody should be able to relate to. Um, and I think you know ultimately what I hope it gets to by the end of the book is um, it, it's sort of about how we all tell ourselves stories about our own lives, um, how we um, take the things that happened to us in the past, and and we uh, even even when we're attempting to be uh, totally you know straight about it, even when we're trying to be non-fictional about it, we do you know we we remember things differently, we fictionalize, uh, our memories are faulty, uh, and so things come back that we uh, didn't necessarily happen the way that we remembered them happening originally, uh, or that you know, or we remember them differently than they happened originally. Um, you know, and, and eventually, you know, you tell yourself these stories over and over again, and eventually the stories supplant the truth. Um, and uh, this happens to me all the time. I'll be, you know, my wife has a much better memory than I do, uh, and I'll constantly, you know, I'll tell some story like, oh, do you remember three years ago we went to this place on our way to your parents' house and we did such and such? Uh, and she'll reply, you know, those were three totally separate incidents that happened like a year and a half apart. Uh, and I've, you know, my, my brain, I guess, just sort of fixed fictionalizes everything and pushes it all together uh, into one story because those pieces seem to fit together. So, um, so anyway, I think that that's, uh, that's hopefully what the, the whole effect of the book is. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's very beautiful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, and thank you guys so much for coming out and, uh, and for reading. And uh, if anybody wants to buy a book, I'm happy to sign it here for you. And uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, and thank you again to Politics and Prose. Okay.